have our followers, friends, clients ask us the differences between an early gen Murcielago and the LP640. And I, because I'm not the know all expert that I sometimes claim to be, imported two friends and fellow experts, Mr. Ed Bullion, Mr. John Hooper, to help us inform you guys, educate the masses. The differences. There we go. So I think, uh, Ed, you sold them for? I did, yeah, sold them for about six years and have owned eight of them now, I believe. And so, you know, I, I think I'm probably tickling about 150,000 miles driven in Lamborghinis. I was thinking about that on my way down because I'm about <laughs> to pass 50,000 miles tomorrow on my manual LP640. Uh, but I love the cars, and you know they made them from 2001 until 2010. Model Year 02 was the first in the U.S., but they are massively different throughout that period. And you have kind of one of everything at the moment, <laughs> one of, which is one of everything. Very, very nice. So we started out with the 6.2 liter cars, and then became the 6.5 liter cars with the LP 640, 650, and 670. And they are all very, very special, and that's what's great. You know the. the I would say it's not quite the magnitude from a 91 Diablo to a 6.0, <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, over the... <laughs> That's a big difference. <laughs> exactly. So the O2 cars, they have a lot of immediately noticeable difference aesthetically. So you've got a blockier front bumper. The LP640s and obviously the LP670s have a little bit more angularity there. And then in the rear, you also have just a single exhaust for the 6.5 liter cars or single exhaust tip and two coming out for the coupes. In 2002 and 2003, all of the cars were manuals. And then in 2004, they introduced e-gear and the take rate we thought was gonna be about 90%. It turns out it became almost 99% by the end of the Mercy's run. And so we see that they're all really, really great cars to own and they're all simple, similar enough in terms of maintenance and you can tell us more about that. But the early cars have narrower seats. They have a totally different suspension setup. So you've got the buttons that you'll see behind the shifter and they have smaller brakes, different wheel designs. All the 02 to 04 cars came with the two-piece Speedline wheels, and then in 2005, which you kind of had a middle generation of the cars, you got the Hercules wheels as standard, and those were only available in silver and a titanium color. So if you ever see Hercules wheels, like around the Roadsters, painted black, they're not supposed to be. Incorrect, not curated. Exactly. Then in 2003, we had the 40th anniversary Verde Artemis cars. Unlike yep. the Diablo anniversary cars or the Countach anniversary cars or the Aventador anniversary cars, you had no color options. And those have a lot of other really, really cool features. They have the perforated leather on the interior. They've got carbon panels behind the windows. They have a titanium color for the Speedline wheels. Which and looks really good. It is spectacular. It looks really good. Yes. Yeah, and, I uh, saw them being made. Sport oh, did you? In real time. Excellent. Uh, gorgeous interior That's on cool. those cars, white That's and black, cool. Sportivo interior. And then the Roadster comes out in 2005. And we've learned lately just how rare the manual versions of the Roadsters are, both in the first-gen cars and in the LP640 cars. But those went ahead and benefited from the bigger brakes, some lighter all-wheel drive components, some better suspension components, a much better front-end lift. And that's what we saw into 2005. And then a couple years later, we get the LP640s. That's where you start to see new options like carbon fiber interiors, q -Satura stitching on the seats, and some other really, really fun stuff, like on this car that has titanium fiber, uh, which is extra special. So cool. And ceramic brakes, right? That's right. Ceramic brakes became an option in 2006, uh, but okay. were super duper rare. Uh, Hoovy's car is one of the last 06s built oh, and wow. it does have ceramic brakes. Okay. And so it also has a preposterous two color creamsicle <laughs> interior and things like that. But the Hermera wheels became an option on the LP640. Uh, those were available in silver or black, not in titanium. There were some cars that it almost seems like were painted titanium from the factory, mm -hmm. like the orange manual car. Yes. But we don't have any evidence. It was never in any ordering guide or anything yes. like that. Yep. Exactly. So we also had a lot of new colors available for the LP640. You had Grigio Telesto, you had Verde Draco. Uh, balloon white is unclear when it was. There mm -hmm. were, there's a lot of repainted early cars yes. in balloon white, uh, but those were really the promotional colors for it. Always we see a lot of yellow, a lot of orange. Verde Ithaca was an option throughout the entire range. Verde Ithaca was first offered on the O2 Marcelo. Yeah. 
And yeah. we had, uh, what was it, Busta Rhymes. I sold his Busta car. Busta Rhymes had mode one. car. Yes. Exactly. Oh, you sold that car. I did, yep. Where did that car end um, up? It, went, it came down from New Jersey. I traded it on a 12 Aventador. Where did we sell it? I think we sold it out towards Texas. Okay. It was, I mean, it had neon lights everywhere, those gigantic, I, I know you <laughs> neon do. Neon lights are great. Yeah, they should be on everything. <laughs> those Hoobie's are not curated. <laughs> Hoobie's car has neon lights. We've obviously talked a lot about how rare the manual cars are, how rare the SVs are. All three have different mirrors. So you have the angularity of the SV mirrors, and then there's a difference in the support oh. spokes for the LP640s. I did not know the LP mirrors were different than... Yes. Huh. Uh, and of course, we know that Mercy mirrors are prone to massive vibrations. And on the LP640s and LP670s, every model year has a different Kenwood radio. So the 07s have one with a silver surround, and the 08s have one that's a little bit better, and the 09s and the SVs have one that's a little bit better than that. Or you can just take the radio out, as I've done, and then you have a little storage right there. <laughs> throw it in the dash. Think, think about how much of an improvement that Kim would have was over the Grundig. <laughs> the, the Becker? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 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 the early yeah, radios right. Grundig. are proper bad. Grundig, yeah. Grundig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're proper awful, and if you the lose Becker the The Becker would have been one of those ones with the navigation. Very oddball. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, because there were factory cars with Beckers. Yeah, with the nav. Yeah. yeah. Incredible wealth of knowledge there. I'll try. We've learned a lot. And, and Ed, recently, you put together the, I would say, the most complete official list type list. Well said. Well spoken. Of Murcielago Vins. Pretty yeah, much so everything. I think so, yeah. So we've always thought that there were 4,099 cars, and I'd been asking the factory, and you had as well for a long time, but we finally got somebody to send us a 97-page PDF of all the VINs, the they same. thought. And so we found cool. that there was a range immediately following that race car that were never built. And so rather than there being 4,099, when you take out the 22 Reventon Coupes and the 15 Roadsters, it, I think it was 39, 35 or so, okay. give or take. Uh, cool. We can show the graphic here that breaks it all down. So we were able to look at the ways that the VINs are constructed. So some of the early VINs for the O2s and O3s started out ZA9, but those were uh, more of like a Diablo VIN convention. But generally, the VIN for a Mercy is going to be ZHWB and then a country code like U. And then there's a three-character uh, designation for the model. So 37M is manual LP640 coupe. 47M is Roadster. And then you'll have a check digit to validate a VIN. And then you'll have a, a character to say what year it is, LA0, and then the build number out of 4,099. Incredible, incredible. And Mr. John Hooper, who not only serviced these, you sold them as well. Yeah, a little you bit. Sold and serviced. Yeah, and, not, uh, not on that level. When was the first time did you go for factory training? O2, O3. So you saw the first Murcielagos being built? Yeah, and saw the anniversaries being made. What would you say are the biggest technical differences? And then drive-wise, knowing how they work, what are the biggest differences that you see when you're driving a car? And what were some of your favorite drives? The difference is, I mean, Ed did the, the list. I mean, brakes, suspension, engine. The 6.5 has like one, one millimeter of bore, bigger, a little more stroke, mm -hmm. different heads, a, a better variable intake, planum, uh, engine, manage engine management's different. Uh, 07 had the Morelli throttle bodies, and then they switched to the Bosch. And then, then they had to add the little ETB with the ECU. Remember that recall? Yep. So that's a little box that made the, the Italian car speak to the German throttle body without any kind of problem. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So when, the ones you'd see with the Bosch throttle bodies, you know, newer. Okay. So that's, uh, this is Morelli. This is 07? Yeah. Yes. 07. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, so the funny. newer one, they switched to Bosch. Okay. I like the way these run. Really? Yeah. Versus I can't the... say I, I'd never t I didn't take a stopwatch to anything. <laughs> uh, I just like the way they work. Okay. I've always been a uh, fan of the manual because it's the best shifting gearbox, in my opinion, of all time. It's smooth. I'll, 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 look, I'll there take a Pepsi challenge. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Any, I'm sure there's somebody that's never driven a car like this that would like to argue me about it, you know, <laughs> uh, on the internet or wherever. <laughs> but you know where to find me, down here, Miami, Florida. Now there were two major recalls we'll do this. that you'll remember. We had to replace all the fuel tanks, 
Yes. And, and we also had to recall on the brake bolts. Yeah. All yeah. So only safety related yes. items we have to worry All about. All the screws for the CCBs. Yes. Yes. And to replace oh, and them. The ceramics only. Yeah. Yeah. Ceramics okay. only yeah. for that. Okay. Exactly. Now you know what's funny. Everyone also asks, and and maybe you guys can both chime in on this. I don't feel like driving. I mean, the SV is obviously feels like a different car. Going to an early gen car to an LP640. I don't feel too much of a difference besides this feels more civilized hmm. and maybe more linear where the earlier cars feel raw. So I'd love your input on driving back to back. I would agree with that, especially at early, early stuff. Yeah. But I really enjoy O3s for some reason, hmm. more than O4. Really? Oh, sure. I don't know why. They just, yeah. they better. O4 was one of those, you know, limbo years. So like yeah. the cheapest Mercy on earth today would be an O4 E-Gear car. So the first yeah. of the E-Gear cars. Yep. The E-Gear is massively improved between the first gen cars and the 640s. Oh. But the primary reason for that, you know, we see that it has goes from 580 horsepower to 631, but the torque difference is almost 100 pound feet. Oh, I and didn't so realize you have that. so much more torque to sustain okay. the shifts. And that coupled with a lot lighter all wheel drive components, especially in the front, okay. make the later cars a lot smoother to drive and a little bit easier okay. to maneuver at low speed. Okay. Like and everything's any, about the same, yes, except for the valve train's different on the 640. So you have, there's still a valve adjustment, okay. but it's just easy on an older car because you have the shims on top of the bucket. Okay. Whereas on the 640, you've got to take the cams out. Wow. The good news is they don't really get that far out. So like doing it, and, and you, you wouldn't mess with it unless you're sitting there with the engine on the floor. And, and really at what point are you going to do it? How many miles would you say? Well, the book says 15,000, but yep. you go in there to go to all that trouble and you have two valves that are like just this, this, this far out. It's like, damn, you know, that's a, that's a lot of work. For but sure. If, if I was doing a clutch and some other things, Maybe oil leaks, yeah, yeah, for sure, check it. it. At least you run it. through and check it. Yep. My car with 50,000 miles has not had a valve adjustment and it will occasionally misfire a bit and stuff like that. So I know the clutch is also getting that pretty close. That might be harness for the, for the that's coils. Yes, yeah. that's a good point there. So I'm anticipating, you know, having, I've put, I don't know, 15, 18,000 miles on the car with really no issues at all. And I, I'll need to, uh, probably, I'll probably put 25 into it at some point, you know, Incredible. in the next few years. But uh, overall, it drove me down here to Miami. It's gonna get me home to Atlanta tomorrow. I would say my opinion for exotic supercars, and I'd love your opinion on this. I think I love selling Murcielagos because I feel like Every time I deliver one, if it's been serviced, it has fresh tires, mm -hmm. I'm probably not gonna hear from the guy no, so ever good. again, <laughs> in the sense of he'll wanna fresh maybe tire. buy a Diablo or Countach after. For sure. But the there's really not just... much to go wrong. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very simple. It's the last of a steel tube frame supercar. Yep. You know, this is it. This is it. I love them. Me too. Yeah. They're wonderful. And you know, when they came out, the idea that if you were doing a clutch or if you lost a shift actuator in an E-gear car, you know, you could start to be pushing $20,000 or more than 10% of the pre-owned value, that got to be a little bit more of a concern for a lot of owners. But today, now it makes where sense. there's non-serviceable double clutch gearboxes and everything that you're talking 30, 40, $50,000 if something goes bad, yeah. they've become relatively a lot more economical to own oh, and put miles it, on. It, it, you look at, it's funny, Haggerty just released a, uh, a great story of how this is the future. You know, manual Murcielagos are the future. And it's interesting they compared it to the Carrera GT. And I love the Carrera GT, do not get me wrong, I think it's an incredible car. But when you just compare the service cost oh, yes. of a Carrera GT, I mean, I've had, we've had a few builds here. Could have a 50, 60, 70, $80,000 service bill for, we're not talking anything, we're talking a, a main seal clutch. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah. A, for a car you drove in without error lights. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is a, <laughs> is a tough place to be. Yeah. But, you know, the, the crazy thing now is that you've got Mercy's from 200,000 up to, you know, up theoretically a manual SV is a three plus million dollar car today. And if someone it, were to sell if one. If somebody were ever to sell <laughs> one of them. But we do know now that there's two that we didn't know about. Just one of them has gone from Singapore to China, the U.S. car. Wow, I found really? found that out recently. Yes. You've so. confirmed that. Um, I have two different people that have said the same thing. And it's so, a U.S. car. It's a U.S. orange manual car that was in Singapore with a huge collector most of its life. It and it has, uh, just a couple of months ago, it left for China. It sold within the last year. Nobody knows for how much. But if it was less than $3 million, then they... Uh, Missed out. They sold it too cheap. That's right. That's I'm gonna right. make some calls into China as we speak. I will look for you. 
I will find you. And I will find you. Well, thank you guys again. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to subscribe. And most importantly, thank you to my brother, John Hooper. My brother from up north, Ed Bullion. You guys are awesome. And I always say that, hey, if you don't know what you're talking about, surround yourself with guys that do. Thanks, guys.